Well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming to tonight's session. I think this topic of you know, making a strong start is really critical. I think we often think about the impression that we're making, but really there's a lot that goes into being strategic when you're starting a new job. And I'm delighted to have Andrea Mascarenas here to, to share her insights. Um, just to add that my role is in the Office of Alumni Relations and I focus on career programs for alums. Um, I also oversee the NUSource networking platform, which is a great resource for alumni to alumni and student to alumni connections. And I think of my role as trying to do a little bit of something for everyone covering different topics and different career stages. Andrea had presented for us back in May 2022 at the early days of the pandemic and um, I still think of some of the points that she made during her presentation, and that's why I asked her to come back. And she'll be presenting, but also taking questions, and we can use the chat um, for questions. And just to share some of her background, um, Andrea joined her current employer, KKR, in 2022, and is a member of the strategic partnerships team within the firm's client and partner group. Prior to joining KKR, Andrea was a member of the private markets portfolio specialist team at DWS, focused on private equity and private credit. Previously, she worked on the institutional sales team and senior relationship management team at Morgan Stanley Investment Management. And she has a BS in international business and finance from Northeastern. So thank you again, Andrea, and I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm very flattered uh, to be here today speaking to alumni. I'm a proud Husky, and I can't believe I'm coming up on 10 years since I graduated. Um, definitely, you know, carrying the Northeastern flag wherever I go, as I really think it's been, you know, the reason for most of my career success. So very, very grateful for all of you taking the time on a Thursday evening to be here. As Michelle said, I'm happy to take questions in the chat box, just I'm coming and I'll address them throughout my remarks. Um, but you know, to Michelle's um, very kind introduction, I have spent probably the last 10 years working in very large corporate sort of asset management firms. Um, my first role out of college straight from Northeastern was at Goldman. And I spent two and a half years there. From there, I went to Morgan Stanley Investment Management, spent five years there on the institutional sales side. That was the first time I went from back office to front office. From Morgan Stanley, I joined DWS. That entire position was during COVID, <laughs> much of it remote, and something I didn't know I would do before I took the offer. And from DWS, I joined KKR, where I am now. And so I'm happy to just spend a minute on what I'm doing at this moment. So KKR is an alternatives investment manager managing um, about 500 million, sorry, 500 billion in AUM across four main asset classes. So they're known for private equity, but they also offer strategies in private credit, infrastructure, and real, real estate. Um, specifically, I spend my time working with institutional clients, some of the largest of the firm, to just offer best-in-class servicing. So any question they have about their portfolio, the markets, how to think about future allocations, how to maximize their returns, how to minimize their risk, those are all questions that come to me, and I work with our teams internally to navigate that. I love this role because, for me, it marries two of my strengths. I think one is just sort of helping people navigate problems, being, you know, sort of their problem solver, but also working with them to leverage everything that's happening in the firm. So I love working with people. And um, when I get something from a client, I usually have to take that internally and find the right person um, within the firm to answer the question, explain why it's important, and then think about how to translate that message. So I've been there for about nine months, it's been a whirlwind, and it's, it's been a fun time. Um, so the topic of today is to think about making a strong start at a new job. Clearly, having moved around a couple times, this is something I have tried and tested a bit. Um, and I will say, you know, take everything with a grain of salt. Of course, it's personal to you, personal to your style. You shouldn't force yourself 
to be an inauthentic version of yourself, but also, you know, your work environment is going to be very different than mine. And so naturally there comes, you know, a bit of adaptation. Um, I would also say COVID roles and when we were all remote is very different than now being back in person. It's also very different for a hybrid environment. So again, happy to navigate some of those specific points, but I'll speak to my experience where the finance industry was very eager to have people back in person as much as possible and as quickly as possible. So my employer had us back in person five days a week, you know, almost a year ago, if not a year plus. So it might be very contrary to what you're experiencing. Um, but when I think about making a strong start at a new job, you know, the first two words that come to mind is just forming likability and trust. If people don't like you and people don't trust you, you are pretty much doomed from the get-go. Um, in order to like you, you have to be yourself, right? You have to be sort of personable. They have to understand who you are and, and what your personal style is. And then more importantly, they have to trust you. Um, if you say you're going to do something, you ha there has to be follow through. If they're tasking you with a big title, a big projects, you know, big compensation, that means that you have to deliver. Um, during an interview process, we say a lot of things about ourselves and there's high expectations. When you get on the job, it's about meeting those expectations. Now, of course, there's going to be a ramp up period. And so there's time to learn, make mistakes and grow, but you want to minimize that and you want to be as transparent as possible about what it takes for the company, your team to set you up for success. So, you know, again, the two keywords I think about like and trust, and I'll walk through a couple of examples. But, um, you know, at the beginning of a role, when you're brand new, there are two people I usually try to identify. One is your manager, the person that's critical for success in your career path. This might be the person determining your compensation, the person delivering your performance reviews, the person who will determine if you're up for promotion. That person has to be kept happy at all times, right? they make or break your career. And so you need to know who your manager is, that you have a clear reporting line. If you have two managers, that can be a little bit trickier to navigate, but you should know that up front and you should know what's expected, who has ultimate say, or do they share say. The second thing you need to identify is sort of a buddy. And a buddy is someone who might be a peer, someone at your age level or your position level, or somebody a bit more junior. A buddy is an informal relationship. This is someone you can ask all of your silly questions to, whether it's, you know, what do we wear to this meeting? Or um, do we go in person? Do we dial in? Should I be on camera, off camera? Where do you save things down? How do I use the printer? That's your buddy. And I, in this current role, found somebody junior to me who had been on the team about a year or two, you know, seemed incredibly nice, very patient, very friendly. That's the person I picked in my head as a buddy. You don't have to say it out loud. Um, sometimes a buddy might be assigned to you. And in that case, that's great. Embrace that. Those two people are going to be critical in those first three to six months. And you want to be thoughtful in figuring out what's their style, what's their form of communication, and matching that to a degree. So, for example, if your manager is very much someone who is busy, on calls all day, sits in an office with the door closed, be thoughtful in how you ask questions. Be thoughtful in how you approach their time. If your manager's, you know, out on the floor, sitting side by side with you, wants to lean over and talk to you throughout the day, match that as well. So it takes a lot of observation in those first few days to just say, okay, what's their style? What seems to work? How are other team members approaching these people? And trying to just sort of mimic that, um, mimic that style a bit. I would say from there, you know, you'll navigate questions, you'll get your training. When you get your training, take notes. One, even if you have a photographic memory and you can remember everything in your head, for someone who's training you, they want to feel like you're paying close attention and so you want to take those notes down. Two, you'll, you'll be surprised at how frequent some tasks are, how infrequent some tasks are, and if three months go by and now you're, it's the second time for you to do something, there's a good chance you've forgotten, so you want to have those notes to go back to. Um, I also am thoughtful in how I ask my questions. So, of course, during the first training, ask a few here and there. Take time to digest. Take time to absorb. Take a stab at something yourself, and if you find you're 
intuition has gotten you through most of the process and there are a few things that are left open, try to be resourceful, right? Maybe there's an FAQ section within the website or the program. Maybe there's a help feature. Maybe there's some sort of internal resource where there's a manual on how to go through something. The more you use the tools around you, poke around and do your research, one, it'll reinforce what you've learned. But two, it'll show to your team like, oh, okay, they had a question. They chose to research it themselves. They're coming to me as sort of second option or last resort. And that makes whoever is the train, the person to train you feel that much more excited about like, okay, cool, this person's taking initiative. Um, the other thing I like to do is save all of my questions, maybe for some sort of weekly catch up or daily catch up. I've had managers who've offered me two different things. So one manager said, hey, for the first 10 days, let's catch up every day and put 30 minutes on my calendar at the end of the day. Since that was you know, his idea, I went with it. And then knowing I had that time in advance throughout the day, I would just keep a log of questions to ask, comments to make, you know, information to kind of provide. Another manager might not be you know, that available and might say, okay, for the first three months, let's meet every week. And then if you have other questions, you know, feel free to ask me in between. And you can use that time the same way. Of course, a time sensitive question, ask on the fly, something that can wait, save it for um, the once a week sort of session. But don't be shy to ask your manager, hey, I would love to catch up with you, make sure I'm on track, give you feedback in real time. What's the frequency that works best for you? Can I set up time with your assistant? And I would be you know, stunned to see um, any manager say, we'll figure it out as we go. Sometimes having something routine, especially in the onboarding period, just makes lives easier for both. Um, in terms of navigating hybrid uh, environment, you wanna ask both your buddy and your manager, what's the norm for the team? How often are we coming in? How early should I arrive? Um, what days should I be in person? What meetings do I go and sit in the conference room versus dialing in for my computer or for my desk? And really see how often those responses align. There's some managers who might say, oh, you know, you can let me know whatever works best for you. But then there's sometimes like unspoken norms of the firm. And so your buddy hopefully will keep it very honest with you and say, yes, my manager might say, you know, you can work from home on Fridays, but secretly they want everybody in five days a week. And so try to kind of figure that out. I know for my manager on days we have client meetings, we definitely want to be in. And usually the day before when there's a lot of prep work and last minute questions, it's so much easier to get that done if I'm in in person as well. The best days to work from home are maybe the days when there are no meetings at all. So I personally, and again, this is speaking to my kind of hardcore finance industry, I would say in those first three months, if you can swing it, try to go in every day, whether it's a slow day or a busy day. And the reason being, one, you'll meet so many more people that way through coffee chats or lunches or breakfast meetings. If people are in different schedules, you'll see the whole range of your coworkers if you're there on a five day a week schedule. And then also, I mean, it just shows hustle. It shows enthusiasm. It shows that you care to succeed. Um, and it shows that you're reliable. Nobody can see how hard you're working or how attentive you are when you're at home in your living room, right? But they can very much see that body language and silently observe when you're in the office. So I think if you can swing it, those first 90 days or those first 100 days, be in, the per be in person every day, unless absolutely the office is closed. Um, I also think as you come out of that 30 day, or sorry, the three month period, be more intentional. Read the room, check in, see what's required. I of course love a good work from home day every now and then. And so I manage expectations in advance. If I want to take a Friday work from home day, I'll let my manager know on Monday. I'll put it on her calendar. I will ask her probably five times during the week. Do you need anything completed before? Do you need me to print anything out for you? Should we talk about certain things? Are we all set for Monday? By the way, I'm working from home on Friday. I reiterate that message. That way there are no surprises on either end and no one feels like someone struck the ball or you know I'm out of sight, out of mind. So 
over communication is usually helpful, especially with senior people who are juggling many things and are going to forget. Um, speaking of, you know, manager communication, ask them what their expectations are. Um, you know, some managers know that if there's an 8 a.m. meeting, yeah, maybe you can take that 8 a.m. from home and then come in for 9, 9.30 and then spend the rest of the day there. Some managers might say, hey, you know, we all leave at six, but we log back in at night. We go home for dinner, we're watching our emails and we might log in. So these are all the sort of nuances to be aware of. The worst pickle to be in is to miss an email or not show up and then you're learning the lesson after the fact. So I always lean into, ask more questions, lean on your buddy if you feel like your manager might be saying the polite thing rather than the accurate thing. I'll pause there because I've just been speaking a lot to see if there are any questions, but if not, I can keep going and shift gears a bit. Okay. So next, maybe thinking about goals and expectations. There are two ways you can go. And depending on your seniority, how new you are into the role and how much of your background plays into the role. I see the question and I will get there. <laughs> so I would say if you are very junior, one to three years of working experience, nine times out of 10, you're coming into a role where there's very little background and experience you can bring into it. Therefore, keep your goals realistic. A lot of the goals may real, um, revolve around learning, you know, sort of incremental success, incremental efficiency, small achievable goals. I think there's an acronym out there for SMART goals, which are like, I, I don't even know the acronym, but it's about being measurable. It's about being realistic. It's about being actionable. These are the types of goals you want to have. Of course, anyone can say, I hope to improve or I hope to get promoted, but you want to be specific in when and how and where and who's going to help you. Um, so being realistic with your goals is first. Second, you also want to be cautious and self-aware of your strengths. So if you are an excellent um, presenter and you love public speaking, right, lean into that and then have goals that revolve around it. If you know for a fact there are some like weaknesses that are forever going to be weaknesses and not relevant to your role, don't make those your goals. Um, I also think about having early term wins. And so the goals don't have to be set out on day one. In fact, I encourage you to tell your manager, hey, I'd like to see the nature of the team, the scope of the work, where there are some problem areas, and maybe in four to six weeks, I'll have a better sense of what my goals can be. Um, you know, you want goals by the time a year goes by to be something you can say the large majority were achievable, the large majority are complete. There's maybe a handful here, which I can roll forward into next year, and they didn't work out for X, Y, Z reason. But definitely play to your strengths and play to things that are interesting to you, relevant to you, and um, actionable from the seat that you sit in. Oh, and then the other thing I will say, you don't want to overextend yourself. If you bite off more than you can chew to seem like a hero, to seem like, you know, an overachiever on the team, that could end up backfiring. And some people might be just a bit overambitious thinking, okay, I'll take on this massive project that nobody was able to complete. I'll look like such a rock star if I, if I get it done. But if you do end up not succeeding in that, no matter what everybody knows about how challenging it is, it will not only knock your own confidence, but it could make people feel like, okay, they don't seem to know what they're good at. They don't seem to know what they're in for. So I usually try not to be an overachiever in the first three months. There are 10 projects you can do and you know maybe you can do nine of them. Be conservative and say, hey, I'll sign up for six. I'll sign up for seven. If there's time left over, I'll tack on one or two more. And I think it's just, you know, you want to set an appropriate bar where you're showing, okay, I said what I can do. And now I'll take on a little bit more and grow a little bit further in the role. Just to maintain your own confidence, but also your manager's confidence. Um, some questions here. So can you please recommend a system for taking and saving notes? Yes. 
Uh, Microsoft OneNote is saved in the cloud. You can access your notes anywhere, including your phone. Yes. So I love that tip. I will say I'm a very late adopter to OneNote. And I don't know if it's just because, you know, we were like on ancient Microsoft uh, Office software, but I really agree with that. I think OneNote is incredible. I am also still a little bit old school and just use a good old fashioned notebook. Um, There's so many times where you roll your chair up to somebody's desk or you're in a conference room. And if you don't have your laptop or it, you know, feels impersonal to be typing away when somebody's explaining something, that is an option. But when in doubt, especially when you're on a Zoom meeting, you're on a conference call, you're seeing emails come in and out. I agree. OneNote is pretty cool. I have a lot of people. Uh, uh, co-workers who have iPads that they bring to work and sort of use that as their notebook. I'm not that fancy, um, but I agree. I think that's a great idea. Um, within OneNote, you can create multiple tabs. You can create checklists. And so my OneNote, the way it's organized, the first tab is my to-do list. And I organize based on this week and everything else. <laughs> and that way, I can move things around and, you know, put due dates and then just check things off as it's completed. I also have in that same to-do list everyone I need to meet. And so one thing that was awesome when I started this role is my manager literally set me up on 50 one-on-one meetings. It took me a very long time to get through the list, but she found and identified the 50 people that would be critical for success in my role. And that's because these are people we um, rely on, people we liaise with, people we go to for information, people who help us set up events, people who help us pull data. And I just picked through that list of 50 names through coffee catch-ups and Zoom meetings. I mean, they were all over the world. And so after I went through that list, as I saw names copied in emails or names popping up in um, you know, meetings and things like that, I would add to the list of people I should just always get into the practice of setting up time to introduce myself and get to know better. So that's kind of tab one. All of the rest of the tabs I organize by client or by, you know, project or by process. So whatever system works for you. Um, How to connect with people from different departments. So I touched on that briefly through the coffee catch up. I'm also big on just organic networking. I think it's very hard to really bond with somebody when it's forced. And I cringe when I have to write that email that says, hi, I'm new. I just got here. Can I set up time with you? And it becomes a very forced conversation. So instead, I like to give it some time, see what names keep popping up on the same emails, see what faces keep popping up on the same Zoom, hear what they have to say, and then piggyback off of that. So for example, one of my emails might look like, hi, my name's Andrea. I just joined the team. Um, You you know, I saw you were on the 1030 call to talk about XYZ. I am working with XYZ as well. You know, would you have 30 minutes to help me better understand your role here and your background? And that ends up being much easier. So I tend to do that if that works for you, um, definitely recommend it. The other easy thing is when you're in person, um, you know, you're walking around with your mentor, you're walking around with your buddy, have them make introductions for you and let them know. Um, A good buddy will do that, but sometimes they just need the reminder. So if you're walking through, you know, or taking the elevator and there's somebody in the elevator and your buddy's talking to them, just say, oh, you know, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm your colleague on the team. By the way, um, you know, would it be okay if I found 20 or 30 minutes to talk to you. And that can be another way to just sort of make sort of the organic interactions. But I I really try to avoid just out of the blue, we've never met and I'm gonna ask you for some time. Okay. Anything else I can spend more time on? Um, It's not have a couple of other tips and tricks that I can share. All right. So let's say, you know, you're past sort of the first 90 days on the job, and now you're feeling a little more comfortable, and you know that 
within six months or within a year, you're going to be having to do that performance review. And you want to really quantify the things that you've worked on. Something I like to do is keep a very simple tracker in a personal folder. And I usually password protect it because you can never be so safe. You can never be too safe. Um, but of course, in that tracker, you can have your goals, you can have sort of the big picture things you want to achieve. But also I track all of the small and big accomplishments. So I organize mine by quarter. I think that's easy. And every month or so, or every week or so, I'll look in and I'll just keep a very rough mental list of the things I was tasked to. Trust me, after 12 months, when it's time for the end of year uh, performance writing season and everyone waits for the last minute, um, you're not going to remember all the times you were pulled into random projects, all the late nights that you, you know, helped save the day on something critical. And so take a few moments to just track it on a weekly or monthly basis. And the easiest way is I have my Outlook calendar on one side or maybe my email. I'll have my tracker on the other side. I'll skim through the Outlook and I'll be like, oh yeah, I went to five meetings on this thing. So like, I'll put that in my tracker as, you know, helped out on so-and-so so project. Um, small and big accomplishments, especially accomplishments related to the culture of the firm. So if you went to networking events, if you mentor somebody junior, if you volunteered, if you, um, you know, found a speaker for one of the diversity groups to use, all of those things count. Um, so really be over specific because this is your log and then you can trim and edit it down. But these logs become so powerful for writing your own performance reviews. And they also help make the case for bonuses and promotions and all of these things that you may need to negotiate. And your manager will never keep track of all the things you, you do the way you will do it for yourself. So do not, you know, don't, don't rely on somebody else's memory. Um, the other thing I think on that point is I've also observed, you know, from role to role, from team to team, sometimes you're not going to have every aspect of a culture that you want in the firm that you go to. There's something you loved from a previous employer that doesn't exist in your new employer. Offer that idea up. Try to be someone who initiates. I think that goes such a long way. And especially when you come into a new firm, most people aren't thinking with the fresh lens. Um, they've maybe tried and given up or they've gotten stuck in their ways. They're sort of just bombarded with things. So when you have sort of the new energy and you're in the honeymoon phase of a new job, be that person who's offering a lot of ideas, of course, respectfully and patiently. And if they tell you, no, we don't do this because of so and so reason, that's cool. But most of the time, I have found that people are really receptive to saying, hey, what did you do at your at your previous employer? What worked? What didn't work? Can you bring a fresh set of eyes to something? Can you tell us what are pain points that you experienced? Because misery loves company. But also, what were the things that what went well? And how do we like borrow those ideas? So, for example, I think one thing that I really liked on my old team is we were good about giving sort of kudos and um, recognition to anyone that did really well at the start of a meeting, especially a team meeting. And I wasn't seeing that as much. And so now I make it a point whenever we have a team huddle to say, hey, so-and-so great email yesterday. So you got a great reply back or, you know, way to go on getting this deliverable out two days before the deadline. That's awesome. Or, you know, anything that's big or small that makes people feel good. I just find when you start the meeting with positivity, it takes like it just takes the edge off and then the whole tone becomes a little bit lighter. I also sometimes just feel like it's so harsh to enter a Zoom and then we just go all into an agenda. It's nice to have a little funny, you know, conversation or, or talk about something topical in pop culture. And so I do that with my manager a lot of, you know, I'll be like, oh my God, did you see so-and-so thing happened at the award shows last night or whatever it may be. I think people also forget we are all humans. We like to bond with each other. There is common ground for everyone, no matter your age, no matter your background. So finding a few common ground sort of conversation starters just helps it 
I don't know, it just helps for more natural communication and just takes a lighter tone through some of these long days and long meetings. I'll pause there. I went through everything pretty fast, but I can give more um, examples of sort of now being in a more senior role and navigating working with junior people, I guess, how that's felt, if that's of interest. Okay, so in most of my roles, I've been the junior most person on the team. And so when you're the junior most person on the team, the job is easy. You just do what you're told. <laughs> you don't mess things up. Um, and also you're navigating, you know, sort of boomer personalities, you know, you know, the traditional stuff that makes them happy. They like their printouts, they like large fonts, they, you know, want things the night before. Those things are, are quite easy. But now I'm in a position where I have two associates who are younger than me. And they first started their career during COVID. So you know, in so many ways, their experience is not traditional. And now we're all in person working side by side of people of all ages, people of all circumstances. And so it's, it's made me reflect a lot more on communication and expectations, and also just realizing um, people have different styles, and, and that's okay. So one example I'll give you is that, you know, they're very much just super techie, very responsive, like lightning fast <laughs> response rate. And that's been great in some circumstances because, and you know, for example, like when we're all working from home, if I send an email out to the group, within one second, I know someone has acknowledged it. They've told me they've read it. And I, I, I see that because they said, hey, Andrea, on top of this, thanks. And that's awesome because the alternative is I send an email, someone's read it, but I have no idea of knowing, right, until they reply. So in some cases, I love that, love the responsiveness. But in other cases, when a client request comes in and within one second, they pounce on it, sometimes you're like, oh, okay, hold on. Maybe why is that not the best thing to do? You know, do we want to think about a response? Are we agreeing to something we can't even do and therefore going to regret our own words or two maybe there's somebody who should be copied maybe there's someone who should be forwarded so now I'm sort of teaching them in what situations should you be super responsive and in what situations should you take a breath take a pause understand what's being asked understand you know what are the implications of something and like maybe it's okay to wait an hour so little communication things like that just nuances between urgent non-urgent you know, one is responsiveness good, one is responsiveness a little too quick. Um, and in those teaching moments, I always try to say things like, "In if, you know, I would typically do this rather than you did this incorrectly. And I think that's a softer way of giving feedback is just to say, oh, you know, when, when I receive emails like this, I typically wait a minute, I double check my notes, I see if there's anything pending, or I see when we've responded to this before, who did we copy on the emails? And that's what I would do. <laughs> and I think it's just sort of, yes, a little bit indirect, but it is easier to receive. And in most situations, they'll be like, oh, okay, I didn't think of it that way. I'm happy to do that next time or so on and so forth. Um, the other thing, you know, of course, work from home is something I think younger people need, enjoy, and, and just want to have a little bit of control over their time. And I'm fully on board. I support it. But of course, you know, when we, when we have sort of a manager who comes from a different working style, I've encouraged them to check in with her a lot more often. Don't wait for her to chase you on an email. Don't wait for her to, um, you know, give you a call. Proactively start the day by saying, you know, hey, I have X, Y, Z things on my plate. I plan to accomplish them by such and such time. If anything else pops up, let me know. I have my phone. Or if you're stepping out, no harm in saying, I'm stepping away from my computer. Like just tell someone, right? And then we all know that if something comes your way, someone else should jump on it. So radical transparency in those situations is encouraged and it won't be penalized. It's okay if you need the flexibility. Um, there are some ways in which they are quite 
literal. And so, you know, if my manager is doing personal calls or tending to other matters or just wanted to read something late in the office until 6.30, 7.30, 8.30, our associates will just sit there and wait, even though they're not busy and they maybe had plans and prefer to go to the gym, just wait until 8.30 because they don't want to be seen leaving before the boss, right? We've all heard sort of that archaic, we'll get in before and you'll leave after. Um, think about that though. Is that really productive? Is that the best use of time? I don't, I personally don't think so. It took me a long time to learn that. And I very much was someone who was more old school in the beginning, but now I've realized if my work gets done, I've built like, I've built trust, I've built reliability. People know my work gets done. It's okay to look at your manager at 515 and say, hey, I'm planning to leave at six today. Is there anything you need me to do before I go? And if they say to you, nope, all good, you're in the clear. But not having that conversation and then just walking out, that could be received with mixed results. So I think that's fair to say, you know, my evenings are important to me. I love going to the gym. I love going to an art class. I have a long commute home. I will be checking emails. I'm available if you need me. And then leaving before your manager. I don't see an issue with that if there is communication and if it's after you've built sort of this reputation of being reliable. Great question, how to get used to speaking in meetings. Practice makes perfect and you have to rip off the Band-Aid. There is no easier way. I would say the first thing just to get comfortable with, you know, your voice in a big room might be asking a question. So if you don't want to add a comment, ask a question. Somebody had a phenomenal, you know, a presentation. There was one aspect you didn't understand. You wanted clarity. Just ask the question. And also, the younger you are, I mean, really, at any age, I don't think there is a stupid question. And I really shame people who judge anyone who asks the question because you never know. You never know what somebody's education or skill set or experience come from. Um, I have seen so many senior managers in rooms just say, hey, I don't understand this. Can you explain it again? Or I didn't follow that point. Can you repeat it? Um, and I think it's a brave thing to do. And if you are confident, that confidence will translate. If you seem sheepish when you answer, ask the question, then everyone's going to be like, oh, okay, maybe they're feeling uncomfortable with their own question. So be on unapologetic and just ask the question. Don't preface it. Don't say, this might be a dumb question, but no, just ask the question. Because the minute you say that, then people are like, okay, should I think this is dumb? So uh, starting with asking a question, then from there you can graduate into maybe making a comment, right? So I heard you say this, from my experience, I've seen that, or in an email I read, or you know, somewhere I saw that there's this point or that point, you can kind of piggyback off of statements you've heard. And then eventually, if you're giving a full on presentation, practice, script yourself, write notes, the mirror, a friend, the whole thing. Um, I had to give an hour long presentation in my mid 20s to a client that was probably three times my age and it was scary, but I wrote a full on script, every single word, I practiced in front of a mirror, I then took that script and I made it set you know bullet points and then from bullet points I made it into like three words and yes it was partially memorized but because I wasn't reading it in you know in the real meeting it didn't come off rehearsed but I knew what I was going to say I memorized it to some degree I had the order and it gave me confidence to also react live should something get thrown my way yeah Toastmasters group is good. I've done, I did try that in New York City. It's a little crazy. There's way too many people, but practice on your friends. Practice it with your roommate. Anyone who can be or just, you know, role play it and, and be sort of this mock um, audience for you. What if things with your manager are not going well? Great question. Whew, this can be tricky. So it depends on how early in the stage and you know what type of things are not going well. If you think there's a breakdown in communication, I think that's salvageable. I think that's something you know you can be proactive on. And first and foremost, you know they always say everyone 
is fighting a battle that we can't see, right? Maybe they're getting pressure from their boss. Maybe things are rough at home. Maybe they're a new parent. I mean, there's a million variables and it helps to have EQ. It helps to kind of assess, you know, maybe there's something bigger to the picture. It's not me, it's not personal, but let's assume the worst that it is personal. Communication is breaking down. You're not getting along. You're not being eye to eye. That can be really challenging. So first I would find maybe a teammate, somebody who knows this person that you can confide in and get a feel for if that's their impression as well. So if multiple people are like, oh yeah, she can be really tricky because of this, right? Or she's facing a lot of pressure and she tends to lash out or she has leadership anxiety and may take it out on people during the busy periods. If you know that about someone, all you have to do is sort of build a thick skin, do your job, kill them with kindness, you know, and then hope for the best. If it's really turning into a problem, I would try to go to somebody else senior on the team and come at it as factually as possible just to say, I really like working at this firm. I really want to be successful here. In order to be successful here, I really need to feel like you know, communication is strong with my team, that I'm being heard, that I'm being respected, and so on and so forth. I'm struggling to communicate with my manager. I feel like we're not seeing eye to eye. And, you know, do you have advice on how I can navigate that? Now, hopefully that person is senior and mature enough to know how to advise you and maintain confidentiality and not, you know, stir the pot or make it worse. Um, and so hopefully they're going to do that. Worst case scenario, if you feel uncomfortable, if you don't want to confront this person one on one, then you say, hey, would you be open to acting as a mediator? You know, can we both have this conversation with you? Can you help us navigate it together? And hopefully they can do that. Um, I have had, you know, communicate like issues with my managers where they're so busy, they're so stressed. Sometimes you just feel like chopped liver and you feel like you're not getting sort of the best of their attention or their time. And it's okay to pull them aside and say, hey, help me help you. <laughs> you know, um, we're in this together. We're on the same team. You know, let's be really transparent here. What feedback that you have for me? Am I not asking enough questions? Am I delivering things too late? What's something I can fix and vice versa? You know, if you give me clearer instructions or you tell me what you need on Monday, for Friday rather than on Thursday for Friday, I'm probably gonna be able to do better. Um, so those are sort of my tips if it's not going really well with your manager. If it's not going well with somebody that's like your peer or your teammate, that's also a really hard conversation to have, but I do think it's important to pull them aside and have a heart to heart. Um, I've had this experience where there was a colleague of mine, you know, we're pretty much plus or minus a few years apart and Every project that we split amongst each other, we would all finish our pieces on time. And, you know, their piece was always late. And I'm like, look, we're a team here. If your piece is late, all of our pieces are late. So what can we do to make sure you're meeting deadlines? Like, can you ask for help? Do you want a smaller piece? Like, let's talk about it. Let's problem solve. And, you know, they always say, like, you have to be a team against the problem, not make it about being against each other. And so that's kind of how I, I try to go at it. Um, another question, as a new entry-level person, how do you balance making decisions using your own discretion versus asking for input and permission? That's a great question. I think early on, it's the safest bet to run you know, all of your thoughts and your, your um, decisions against maybe that buddy. And so I would always say to my buddy, hey, can I sanity check this with you? Can I get your judgment on something? Am I phrasing this well? Um, is this the way I should think about this? And it's a quick yes or no, right? And it's better to be safe than sorry because you don't want to have a blow up. You don't want to kind of tarnish your name in those early days. Of course, it's forgivable, but still. Over time, though, if you have strong judgment, you know why, you've seen a scenario enough time, you kind of understand where everyone's at. Um, I think it's okay to do something with your own judgment, knowing, but think through what the consequences could be. So for example, um, you know, with my current manager, her clients are like her babies. She's been 
you know, working with them for 10 plus years, a lot of reputation and, you know, time and relationship built over time. So any email I would send to them, I would just quickly say, you know, hey, do you want to proofread my email or do you mind if I can just send you a draft and you can react to it? My draft is my draft is with my judgment, with my thoughts, the way I do things. And as my manager is reacting to it, you know, it may not be perfectly her style. Maybe it's a bit more formal than she writes, but that's okay. She seems to be okay with it. She's giving me just little touch-up things. And then, you know, we do that four or five, 10 times. If by the 10th time I'm getting no edits and it's totally fine. And I know that she, you know, I, I know the pattern of what she typically looks for. Then at that point, I'm just going to start shooting it out. Um, but when in doubt, be safe. And of course, there are moments where that person might be like, no, it's good to go. I trust you. I know you know what you're doing. Once you're there, then you don't have to overthink it as much. When in doubt, also use the examples that are around you. So every time I see somebody wrote like a very well-written email, it was super clear. I like the, you know, the phrasing that they used. I like the way they color coded it or anything like that. I actually save all of those emails into a special folder and I call it sort of like my email templates. And that way I can pick and pull ideas from really well-written emails. You don't need to recreate the wheel. So that's what I do. Um, anything else? I mean, I may suggest I love the book, The First 90 Days. It's a short, easy read. It's available on Amazon, um, probably a local bookstore. And there are pros and cons to the book. On one hand, I do feel like it's tailored to a bit more of a senior uh, employee who might be coming into a management position. And it also was written before COVID was a thing and remote work was a thing. So not everything in there is attainable or relevant, but um, there's a big section in there about goals and how if you are too ambitious and you fail, that's actually worse than not, you know, having smaller goals that you're really good at. And it really drove home the point for me of these small, easy wins, just to sort of get your name out there, just to get people you know, feeling like, oh, okay, she knows what she's doing and you feel like a hero. They think you're great. And it's just small, easy wins that you knew you could come in and do. So I quite like that book. I mean, I'm not strict with myself on measuring every day at work and kind of tallying it, but you'll see, you'll feel the tone shift when you've been there for a while. I will also say imposter syndrome is real, right? It happens. Um, of course, Coming into a new job, I felt very much like the new kid on the first day of school. I didn't know where to sit. I didn't know who I was going to have lunch with. And those emotions are normal and very human. You do the best that you can. Um, but it gets easier. Time helps. Again, that frequency of being in the office helps, being proactive helps, and sort of making those organic um, introductions. The other thing is after every co coffee catch-up that I had, I would immediately end with sort of a question of like, you know, I loved meeting you. I thought this was great. Is there someone on your team who you think I should meet? Is there somebody you find to be a rock star at the firm I should meet? And then that creates the next conversation. And you can also say, hey, so-and-so, I'd love to meet with you. I just had a catch up with, you know, this person. They were raving about you. They think you're such a rock star. I'd love to take your brain if you have a couple of minutes. So just sort of creating that loop for intros. Um, what else? I have like some random outlook tips and calendar tips that I like. So, you know, everyone uses email almost like instant messenger these days. And so an inbox can explode very quickly. Um, I have probably like 30 to 50 or maybe not 50, mm, call it 30 to 40 folders. And I am pretty religious about moving all of my emails to folders the minute I've read it. I've absorbed it. The action item is done and I just file it away. So I use the folder system a lot. 
The other thing I do is I do a lot of conditional formatting within Outlook so you can color code incoming emails. So emails from my boss come in in red um, and it's very easy to see. Emails from my clients come in from blue and I know it's an external email I have to address. And then, you know, emails from, I don't know, maybe like the compliance training videos or like all of these deadlines that seem to get buried away. I'll file into another color. And so that just helps you feel a little bit more in control of your inbox. I also pride myself on having zero unread messages at the end of each day. And that's because the minute I read it, it gets sorted. And now everything that's sort of in the inbox acts almost like my to-do list. So if it's sitting in my inbox, it means it's something that I have to do. If there's nothing in my inbox, one, that's a miracle, but two, um, that means, you know, everything that's sorted has been put away. I don't delete any emails unless they're like truly spam. I save everything. Um, and that's because in a pinch, when you're looking for something, you can keyword search and you find a whole trail. So whatever works for you. I don't know how good the uh, storage and archive systems are, but I'm testing the limits daily. Um, tips for prioritizing tasks. When you're new, you may not know, you know, what deadlines are immediate, the seniority of different um, people who might be asking you for things. So always ask someone. But, you know, the good rule of thumb is if you know it's something you can get to instantly and it doesn't take a lot of time, get it done and just keep it moving. If you know it's something that does take a, t a lot of time and you need that time, you should at least reply to it to say, confirming receipt of your email, happy to get this to you by the end of the week. Even if you think it's a one or two day task, give yourself maybe an extra day. Um, and let people know when they can follow up with you, when they can chase you and that you've read their email. When in doubt, ask your manager, ask your buddy, and just say, hey, I have two things due at 4 p.m. today. I'm not sure I have the bandwidth. Or if one thing, um, you know, which one should I prioritize? I'm sure somebody can tell you. Um, also look people up, look up their positions, look up their titles, think about the ask, think about, you know, is this the final step of a task or is this something in the middle? And so if I'm late, does it create a domino effect for everybody else? We'll I have, have a quick question. Sorry. Yeah. How do you go about being the youngest person in, in the organization that you work for? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard because you feel like you sort of get, you know, all of the grunt work and a, a lot to manage. And also there's probably tasks coming from multiple people at any given time. Um, and they all don't know what they're giving you, right, to work on. So it's really hard in that sense. One, I think, be hyper-organized, keep that to-do list. If you feel like it's getting out of hand, it doesn't hurt to blast out your to-do list to the team or maybe to just your manager to say, hey, this is everything on my plate this week. I can do it, but I'm having some trouble prioritizing or, you know, this feels like too much. Do you think there's anything here on my list that I shouldn't be working on because it belongs with somebody else? And if you come at it from that angle proactively rather than waiting until you're drowning, someone's more likely to help you. But it sucks. I, I mean, I think I waited eight years into my career before I had somebody actually designated, um, you know, junior to me to help out. And so you just do a lot, you try your best, and you, you also have to manage up and you have to tell people, hey, you're, you know, I sent this to you to review. If you don't review it today and you sit on it for three days, it's going to back me up for a bunch of other things. So can you please take a look? And I was not shy with any of my managers to say, I sent you something on Friday. I need you to review it by Monday. And if you don't, I'm going to chase you. <laughs> or I'm going to print it out. I'm going to put it on your desk. So I think managing up, there's a very polite way to do. Um, managing around you. Also, when somebody, the minute somebody emails you something that has a competing deadline, reply back and say, hey, I see that you want me to do this. FYI, I'm also working on something else. Do you, you know, is there flexibility here or not? Um, do you think somebody else on the team is equipped to help you with this? I just want to be fully transparent and avoid, you know, potentially being crunched for time. Okay, awesome. Thank you. 
no problem. Okay. So I know there's a couple minutes left. Maybe I'll just wrap it up here if that's okay, Michelle. If not, tell me. But you know, wishing everyone just all the best wherever your career goes. I know um, it's hard. It's there's a lot of doom and gloom out there in the world, but hopefully. You know, you guys are feeling great in your jobs. And if anyone has any other follow-up questions, I'm more than happy to answer offline. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, you covered so many different topics, which is really helpful. Um, what's going through my mind is you sound like someone who would be great to work with or work for. <laughs> and it's just, it's you know, we don't often get insights into how people carry on with their jobs. So I really appreciate your getting into some of the details of how you, you just seem really on top of things. <laughs> in a very demanding, <laughs> in a very demanding <laughs> environment, so it's really helpful. Um, and I think it, that idea of the buddy really stuck with me from the previous presentation. Um, you know, and just thinking about that, and also thinking about how we communicate. Um, and thanks for everyone who came today. There's lots of great questions that you asked here, so we created really good content. Um, but it was very thoughtful and. Uh, really good insights from all your years of, of work experience. So I know uh, Andrea didn't hesitate to say yes to uh, coming and speaking, and I'm really grateful for that. And it's wonderful seeing your success over the years. So thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. And now all my success, I credit to Northeastern. So <laughs> I'm glad we all share that in common. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll just put in a plug for next Wednesday night. We have another session. We have um, five alumni speaking about what's next, talking about um, just managing your career and navigating the different decision points. Um, so we'll hear from different alums and, and have it be also kind of a discussion and taking your questions. So that's going to be um, Wednesday, February 1st at seven o'clock. And that's listed on the events website of the alumni office. So again, thank, thank you, Andrea, and thank you all for joining tonight. Great participation. Thank you. Good night.